Warning, I've been saving up some cuss words over the last couple of weeks. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Roger Stone's prosecutorial team. And they're gone. They're gone? Can they just be gone? I guess they're gone. Weird. And now, The Scathing Atheist. G'day. This is Eli's Australian accent coach. And despite the fact that Eli is a very naughty boy... By G, by Jingo, by Crikey, he's bloody right when he says that we did in fact evolve from filthy monkey men. It's February 13th. And if you want to podcast a day for a year, this is the episode to help you do it. Except not this year, though. I'm right. No Illusions. <laughs> I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Joe Rogan's New Jersey, Repetitive. Cincinnati Swing State, and Good Husband, Georgia, this is The Skating Atheist. On this week's episode, we talk about the moral beacon that is Mitt Romney. <laughs> You'll remember right now to go to a florist and get price gouged by the Martin Shkreli of Roses. <laughs> and Hillary Morgan Farrer will try to figure out how to doubt skepticism. But first, the diatribe. When the media talked about Mitt Romney's decision to vote to remove Trump from office, every outlet I saw was careful to give religion a little bit of unearned positive publicity. Right. They all pointed out that he did this because of his religious convictions. And I'm over here asking what are the kind of convictions he has? Right. Like, what's the difference between saying he did this because of his religious convictions and just his convictions? Right. And don't get me wrong, I, I get that Mormons have plenty of religious convictions that the rest of us don't share. And if Romney just voted to remove Trump from office because he was a coffee drinker that kept divorcing one wife before marrying the next, it would make perfect sense for the media to point out how religiously motivated it was. But the moral preset we're talking about is bribes are bad. There's no Mormon doctrine on bribes that diverges from the standards. So when they say this was motivated by his religious convictions, they're not claiming he has different moral standards to weigh Trump by. They're claiming he has different moral standards to weigh himself by. It's not that he has different morals than non-religious people or less religious people. He has the same morals, just better. And I'm sure many people would be tempted to excuse all of this as the media just passing along Romney's own assessment of the situation. He said his religion made him do it, and reporters are just dutifully relaying that message. But if I did a good thing and then I told the fucking press, yeah, well, you know, he was obviously guilty, and I have very high moral standards ever since I tried ZipRecruiter.com and used promo code SCATHING, I don't think they'd be as quick to parrot my fucking reasoning. Right. If, if you said you did a good thing because of your atheism, sure, they might report on the fact that you said that, but they'd all distance themselves from the statement as clearly as they could when they did. And yet when the commentary comes about Romney, it's all from people who are buying into this. His God made him do it line of shit all the way. And, and, and maybe other people are tempted to overlook it because, you know, like, what else are they going to say? I mean, is a CNN pundit just going to say, well, and Mitt Romney crossed the aisle because he's more moral than the rest of the Republicans? And I mean, the obvious answer to that is just yes. And why the fuck would even a theoretical person not think that was the correct answer? But also by the standards that people in Congress measure themselves by, is it any more insulting for CNN to imply that these people are less moral than Romney than it is to imply that they're less religious? Right. When people imply or even buy into the implication that Mitt Romney took a moral stand because of how religious he was, they're reinforcing a despicable bigotry against the non-religious. If we set aside our cynicism and grant him only the most altruistic motives, then at best we can say he took this moral stand because of how moral he was. But the words moral and religion are not fucking synonyms. And when they're used interchangeably, it implies that you and I were not even capable of reaching that fucking storied playing field of morality that religious people stand on. Right. But but look, if religion was correlated with conviction, wouldn't Congress be loaded the fuck up with it? 
After all, every single goddamn member of Congress is religious, 100%. It's not just the most religious body in the country, it's the most religious body that's theoretically fucking possible. And if you really want to lean into your bigotry and declare that the Christian religion is better than the others, well, then the absolute paragon of ethical integrity should be the group of people Mitt Romney distinguished himself from by doing the minimally ethical thing. Of course, religious people would defend themselves from this charge by turning into the goddamn Scottish Immigration Services. Oh, well, they're not true Christians. They just say they are to get elected. And you know what? That might actually mean something if just saying that wasn't their whole fucking thing. Right. Telling Jesus he forgives you is the only qualification for their club. And if we're doubting what people tell us about their religion, why did we only start doing that after we endorsed this story about Mitt Romney and his moral convictions? I mean, I think I can prove empirically that I'm all in favor of doubting every goddamn thing religious people say about their religion, so long as we're not being random about that shit. In this instance, the no true Scotsman fallacy isn't just covering up the problem, it is the problem. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, as soon as a religious person shows some fucking hint of morality, our culture says, wow, look how religious he is. And when the same person bullies the gay kid or tortures the family dog, the fucking exact same culture looks at the exact same person and says, well, he's not being very Christian right now, is he? And I've got to say, it's really depressing to reflect on the fact that there is literally no amount of child rape complicity that's going to break that rhetorical habit. Right. Even after we learn that the world's largest religious institution actually is what the nutters think Comet Ping Pong is, we still shorthand morality with references to religion. We add the modifier religious before conviction instinctively, even though it doesn't modify anything. Hell, I've caught myself using church going as a euphemism for moral person. So to be clear here, convictions are what you have when a universal moral precept compels you to act in an ethical way. Religious convictions are what you have at the end of the child rape trial. Or at least that's what you'd fucking have if we had that first kind. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are a sight for sore eyes and a sight to behold. In fact... One of the best parasites I know, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. <laughs> Fellas, are you as attached to a host as he is to you? Um, I think we all feel each other's presence. No. Leech, I see what you did there. Thank you. I feel like I love you more than you love me, but whatever. You're, bug not, jokes. you're not doing yeah, anything. Yeah, I've got one. <laughs> it's not bugs, it's <laughs> parasites. Just that I don't know how to express it, Eli. <laughs> <laughs> all right. In our lead story tonight, listeners in our nation's capital may have noticed the fabric of the universe tearing apart and a fairly large event horizon over the Washington Hilton last Thursday morning. <laughs> and, uh, that could be jarring, but, but don't worry. It was just Donald Trump and a bunch of evangelical psyop domestic political terrorists causing a black hole of hypocrisy to form during the national prayer breakfast. Trump gave a speech to that secret theocracy cabal about the perils of justifying moral actions by invoking one's faith. So that is why time became space and space became time for a little space there. But eh, the dimensions are back now, so it's fine. Are they? And now I'll be talking about people who over tan. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, that's my bad. Tyler, can we get a trash bag to cover that up? Just make a trash bag. <laughs> And some tape. All right. So, Heath, I don't mean to embarrass you here, but warning D.C. residents about the hypocrisy black holes is like warning New Yorkers there's going to be traffic on the bridge. OK, well, that's true. That's fair. news program Everybody. every morning about that stuff. Yeah. No, I'm not embarrassed at all. <laughs> <laughs> so Trump walked out and immediately started waving around newspapers, including a copy of The Washington Post that said Trump acquitted on the front page. But. You know, they print a bunch of fake news in that paper. So everyone in the crowd got a little confused. It's not clear. Yeah, right, right. No, it's, it's like when Ken Ham finds that one sentence of science that seems to agree with him. Yeah, suddenly now this is <laughs> yeah. a uh, credible source. Oh, no, weird. absolutely not. But <laughs> regardless, most of Trump's speech was basically a victory lap about 
just barely not getting convicted of the crimes that were fully acknowledged even by the Republican senators who voted to acquit him. Uh, I guess that's a victory if you <laughs> switch around time and space. Uh, actually, it's still um, not. doesn't matter, though, nope. because <laughs> he'd already started saying Jesus really loud and started talking about Christianity. And then he went on to explain, quote, I don't like people who use their faith as justification for doing what they know is wrong. End quote. <laughs> so that's when you probably saw the event horizon start happening. Yeah. Right. And we should point out that, like, this was bizarre for the national prayer breakfast, right? Like, that's, yeah, right. That's supposed right. to be a bunch of weirdo, boy, do we all believe in a talking ghost speeches. And Trump used it to talk about his enemies list and getting away with treason. Well, yeah. I will see you that and raise you, Eli. This was bizarre for like Donald Trump at the national prayer breakfast, right? The first time he was there, he spent most of his time making fun of Arnold Schwarzenegger's TV ratings. So this was weird That's compared true. to that. <laughs> he did. That's true. Yeah. And just to be clear, that comment, it was definitely aimed at Nancy Pelosi and even more so at Mitt Romney. Right. Of course, Romney was the only Republican senator to be intellectually honest and vote to convict Trump of the crimes that everyone agreed he committed uh, and w when I just said intellectually honest, I actually meant uh, the opposite. Romney explained mm -hmm. his yeah. vote to convict <laughs> by saying he was guided by his Mormon faith, which is a terrible fucking reason to do that. Well, <laughs> it's a terrible reason for anything to ever do, pretty much. Nonetheless, the entire audience at the prayer breakfast gave a big ovation and agreed with Trump. But for the wrong reasons. Again, we're, we're at level three wrongness minimum at this point. <laughs> These people thought Romney was wrong because I guess he has the wrong religion slightly. He's Mormon Republican Christian instead of Jesus Republican Christian. And, you know, if you're a Jesus Republican Christian justifying terrible behavior... Actually, correct behavior in this case, but remember, level three wrongness here, minimum. Yeah, right, right. Justifying your behavior with the right religion is the ultimate incorrectness to them. Except they were not aware of this hypocrisy thanks to that third layer of wrong. And maybe the inversion of space time, which does complicate things. So, yeah, leave off the maybes, man. I don't want to put too much pressure on you, but if you have to do a correction on this story, we're going to need to hire fucking. Leonardo DiCaprio just to keep track of the layers. We cannot afford Leonardo DiCaprio. So nail we'll, this shit. Let's hope you're not working off a yik yak as well. We'll switch around space time. We'll pay him by the like the mile instead of the hour. We'll oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. So um I think we might have found a problem with religion here. Um it ruins everything. It does. <laughs> <laughs> it, its mode of thought can't really coexist with the fundamental laws of the universe. Even when you get something right, you didn't really get it right. And it leads to situations, this is the most important part, where Mitt Romney is the fucking good guy in a story. We can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a weird one. It is a yeah. weird one. And in not a Juniversity news tonight, someone... Who sounds an awful lot like he needs three new best friends has given the University of Texas one million dollars to study secular Americans. And done. It was Noah. Noah was the one. <laughs> we <laughs> found it. Does, cool. does sound like somebody who needs three best new best friends. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So the badass in question is handsome person who I love very, very much, Brian Bolton, a retired research psychologist, author of 10 books, winner of 12 research awards in his former field. And he also has possibly my favorite meet a member interview ever published by the FFR. <laughs> it's pretty great. Best part. This is actually all in a row in his answers to this little interview thing. I'm a humanist minister, distinguished Toastmaster, the highest nice. level, black belt in karate, and we're all going to die. Next on the docket for everybody is eternal non-existence. Get used to it. <laughs> yeah, so and, and hey, so to be clear, when Eli makes fun of, like, when he does the risk control jokes, he's talking about other black belts than you. 
Right, like the ones whose ass you would obviously kick with your wrist control is the one exactly, that he's making. exactly. My wrist and while Bolton or or the Bolt, as we'd probably call you if you decided to be our best friends, and we'd like well, very play, much hang out, play <laughs> ping pong together. Yeah. So while he doesn't have a personal connection to the University of Texas, he's providing a much needed first step in the field of research. UT will be the first public university to have an endowed chair for secular studies, which is super fucking depressing when you say. Compare it to how many endowed chairs for Christian apologetics yeah. Harvard has. <laughs> right, yeah. How many do they have? So many. A lot. So, obviously, this is great news, and the secular community is very grateful to Bolton, but we here at The Scathing Atheist are ready to take it one step further. Hit it, Morgan. I don't think we are. Please, no. <laughs> Hi, I'm Eli Bosnick. And I'm Heath Enright. You know, our fine nation has thousands of religious universities. Millions even. No, ju no, just thousands. But here at The Scathing Atheist, we're ready to change that. Introducing the Scathing Institute for Doctoral Studies. Or as our students call it, SIDS. Wow, wow that, that is an unfortunate acronym. Anyway, I guess we're gonna go with it for now. Uh, pin in that, here at SIDS, I guess, we provide an educational curriculum that we feel confident is full of true things as much as any religious school. More if you count BYU and Liberty University. That's right. We've got the head of our history and science department, no illusions. And head of our political science department, Keith Enright. And Eli Bosnick heading up the humanities. Because you technically can't be wrong about those things. <laughs> so you'd like to jumpstart on your education Ask Brian Bolton to give us $1 million. The Scathing Institute for Doctoral Studies. Exactly as good as BYU. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No, I'm, I'm, I endorse it. I'm all about it. There I'm, you go. Good. I'm good now. He's no illusions and he approves this message. <laughs> <laughs> and in presidented and scratch news tonight. Atheists have reason to celebrate this week. It turns out that almost two thirds of Americans aren't bigoted enough to tell a stranger on the phone that they wouldn't vote for a well-qualified atheist for president. <laughs> this is so Woo! sad, but kind well, yeah, of Yeah, right. No, in related news, we need to find better shit to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so this comes to, uh, to us from a recent Gallup poll, and it's a question that they've been asking for more than half a century, right? They started asking it uh, back in 1958, and it wasn't until as recently as like episode of 121 of this show that a majority of Americans said yes they would vote for a qualified person even if they only believed in real stuff and as of the survey they released this <sighs> week the group swelled all the way up from 58 percent to 60 percent crushing it and you guys said I could never run for president um <laughs> You think atheism is what's holding you back there, buddy? Yeah. Well, <laughs> atheism? That's, that's, that's the one sticking point? It was. Eli, I just said you <laughs> couldn't run, okay? I didn't say four or something. So, yeah, the, the story here is definitely that 40% of the country is so bigoted against us that they don't even feel the need to lie about it on the phone to a stranger. Because, look, on the same survey, 66% of Americans said that they would vote for a well-qualified Muslim. That's definitely bullshit, right? Okay, and 93% said they'd vote for a well-qualified woman, and yet only 27% hmm. of them did. We have data on that, don't we? Yeah, <laughs> and it's important to be reminded that while we're certainly not the most oppressed group in the country, in a lot of ways, we're still the most hated, or, I'm sorry, not, I don't want to overstate it. We are at least, like, we're the ones that the biggest don't know they're supposed to lie about <laughs> hating the <laughs> most. terrifying. <laughs> Right, well, they, yeah, that fucking matters a lot, especially when it means that rationality damn near disqualifies a person for leadership. <laughs> yep. Yeah, like we started out with laws that black people and atheists couldn't hold office, but only one set of those rules is still around. <sighs> yeah, unless well, you count Georgia. Well, there's <laughs> that. Yeah, Georgia yeah still uh, but real quick couple. before Eli says that we should be allowed to say slur words, we're aware of <laughs> yeah. the giant difference there. Those are different. Are. That being said, mm -hmm. the fact that We'd actually have to remind the KKK that they hate us, too. That does sail. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm brave enough to say it. Atheists have it worse than African-Americans wow. historically in the United States. Yeah. Oh, definitely not the point yeah. of the story. 
All right, I think it's also <laughs> worth noting, by the way, that the only thing they asked about that rated lower than atheist was socialist. Jesus Christ. Right? And don't, <laughs> don't send me an email about that. Send it to Gallup or, you know, the fucking 55% of people who said they wouldn't vote for one. Literally, the only group that they asked about where the majority of people were like, oh, fuck that noise. It's also the only group that had less support among the American population than it had when they did this five years ago, by the way. And if you want a great dose of depression juice, when you exclude religious considerations, the four lowest ranking groups, according to Gallup, in terms of America's willingness to vote, read like a goddamn intentional description of the Democratic frontrunners. It's gay slash lesbian, under 40, over 70, and socialist. Jesus. Uh, also, my OK Cupid profile. <laughs> <laughs> That's... Real scary. That's literally Iowa, New Hampshire. You just read who won yep. Iowa, New Hampshire. Yep. I, sh I sure did. Everybody I that's sure did. unelectable here. Great. And, and, Bern and Bernie's essentially an atheist, too, right? Like, if, yep. man, if we could fucking get goddamn Mayor Pete to convert to Islam, we'd have the we'd have the bottom six all locked down. Fantastic. Uh, Where did Pete Buttigieg have his uh, honeymoon? Hopefully not like. I don't know, North Korea. What what happened there? We got to like look into some stuff. <laughs> Fuck. And now that we've all reached our requisite depression quota, we're going to take a quick break and hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucid. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she wants. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massachusetts. For a lot of years, Republican lawmakers have known they could get pressed by proposing blatantly unconstitutional laws against abortion. The way the cycle worked was that such and such legislature from Mississippi or something would introduce a bill that would mark every woman who got an abortion with a scarlet letter for two years or something. People like myself would freak the fuck out about it. It would get smacked down by the rest of the legislature or the courts, and that asshole would go back to Podunk and tell all of his constituents that he was fighting for their unborn babies. Now, this led a lot of well-meaning people to ask why folks like myself even bothered to get ourselves worked up about it. Why play the pawn in this jackass's game? Well, the truth is that women's rights were the pawn in the game. That's the thing he was willing to sacrifice. And now that those once ridiculous laws are starting to see a sympathetic Supreme Court, the reason we did it is getting a bit more obvious. So here's the latest version of this cycle. Oklahoma State Representative Jim Olson introduced a bill in his state that would fine any doctor who performed an abortion and take away their medical license for a year for providing a perfectly legal medical procedure. He does work in an exception for cases where women's lives are in danger, but keep in mind that if a law like this came to fruition, that would mean that in the moment when a pregnant woman's life was on the line, the doctor's chief concern might well be whether or not he can prove that that was the case later. And yes, the bills passed the House with an overwhelming majority because almost everybody in Oklahoma is fucking terrible. It's not a law yet, but given the direction of the political wind, who the hell knows? And given the direction of the judicial wind, I'm not even confident it would get smacked down anymore. And if you need a reminder the extent to which the people fighting for these laws don't understand the consequences of those laws, we got one of the greatest examples of that in history from an anti-abortion activist named Jamie Jeffries, the pro-life wife. She posted the following on Facebook. And sorry in advance for the length of the quote, but you really have to hear all of this. Quote, I talked a mom out of an abortion in February. Her baby is six months old now and was just removed from her family's custody by DCS. Unfortunately, it was probably a justified removal. But this family put me down as next preferred placement for the baby. Dude, me? No. No, 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 no. I do way too much for this work already. A six-month-old will break me, destroy my marriage, and physical health. I just can't. End quote. Now, this was posted a while back, apparently, but it just recently went viral, leading the pro-life wife to spout out a bunch of excuses about all of that being taken out of context, as though that were not a self-contained story. But I don't want to be accused of the same, so let me add all of the context here. Jamie Jeffries is a privileged white lady who never actually considered the consequences of her actions and still hasn't. And on that note, I'll hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And next up in headlines, 
We have a story about Arkansas State Senator Jason Rapert. So, first of all, Jason, a big congratulations on that goatee finally filling in the gaps at age 47. <laughs> That's we knew you could do it, you. buddy. Good stuff. <laughs> well, it, almost. It's we, almost yeah. there. Almost <laughs> filled in. You're looking great. Ish. You're looking great. Almost great. You're looking almost great. It's almost there. <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, once that gapless goatee is in full effect, just mwah, you'll be ready for prime time. In 1996, but more importantly, <laughs> congrats on just fully embracing the pure evil and fighting to shut down literally Sesame Street. And somehow you found a way to do that based on homophobia. It's almost wow. impressive. It's not. Yeah. It almost uh, is. Let me guess. Uh, episodes will no longer be sponsored by the letter G. <laughs> okay, all right, okay, you joke, but how surprised would we really be if this story ended with Raper calling for a boycott on H's, R's, and the number four, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah, so uh, this is a real thing that Arkansas tax dollars pay for. They're paying Jason Rapert to spend time monitoring the guests on Sesame Street, comparing that to the list of gay actors th that he apparently has <laughs> and then threatening to shut down the PBS affiliate for the entire state if they try to air an episode featuring Tony Award winning actor Billy Porter who is on his weird list apparently Porter was wearing something other than hetero man pants in one of the segments <laughs> and in Jason Rapert's stupid fucking face that means Sesame Street is promoting the very dangerous gay puppet agenda. And yep. I'm really not exaggerating with that phrasing. Nope. He went on Facebook and posted a link to an article about this episode of Sesame Street, including a picture of Billy Porter wearing a, to be clear, fabulous tuxedo gown. It's it was beautiful. Nice. And yeah, it looks fantastic. It, thank you. Yeah, it does. And Rapert asked the people of Arkansas the following in that post. He said, do you approve of your taxpayer dollars being used to promote the radical LGBTQ agenda of not enough hetero man pants, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and then he did not add, I'm on the clock right now attacking Sesame Street. I'm an adult. This is serious. Yeah, right. No, wouldn't want your taxpayer dollars to be uh, miss. No, never mind. I'll be. I'll come back. I'll come back. I'll take no, that time and say? I'll come back. Finish your thought, no, I'll come Jason back. Rapert. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> and here's the scariest part of this to me. Well, other than the general idea that evil bigots are allowed to hold office and also vote in this country. But besides that, much larger problem. This means that in Jason Rapert's mind, Sesame Street played a large role in his sexual development. <laughs> and, uh, Robert Jason, Ducky fucker Jason yeah <laughs> hate to break it to you buddy but Bert and Ernie were super gay and yeah they were so are you because that's how Sesame Street works <laughs> so <laughs> deal with it yeah you figured it out get used to it you're gay and finally tonight in maggot news uh, right wing activist Pastor and self-hating oh. Dana Carvey character Mike Heath <laughs> appeared on Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer's YouTube show Pass the Salt last week and announced that he's launching an international crusade inspired by Donald Trump that he's titled the Faggots Are Maggots Tour. Yeah, that's that's real. So obviously vile slur in the title. In fairness, though. I'm sure they tried to rhyme something with gay and just got overwhelmed. Because, you know, rhyming <laughs> is hard. There's so many right. fucking no, gay rhymes. Fucking Juku was already taken. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> yeah. Tough. And it's a whole thing. <laughs> so uh, here's what Mike had to say about his please don't find out I'm gay tour. Quote, now, I should point out, this quote is going to be confusing because Heath made a joke that is identical to this real quote just now. So lock in, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> quote, real quote. The tour is inspired by the work of Donald Trump. This isn't satire. I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fucking satire is ruining everything. You can't be actually evil anymore. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, no, good disclaimer there. Good disclaimer, Mike. 
He continues, I started supporting Donald Trump early in the 2016 primary for one reason. He insults his enemies. He makes things personal that deserve to be personal. The decades of leftists being the only ones allowed to make everything personal are over. It's long past time for Wasp Manners to take a backseat to the truth. Long past time, end quote. Yeah, oh, the, the people who literally invented all of the slurs have been nice for too long, right? White yeah. Anglo-Saxon Protestants are finally getting their day in the sun. It's about fucking time. <laughs> hey, uh, Mike, Coach Dave, quick little PSA for you. If you've been white Christian men in the United States for decades and you haven't been succeeding... It's because you personally are a miserable failure of a person. Yep, yep. Exactly. Yeah, it really isolates yep, yep, yep. a lot of variables, so it's definitely just you. Just you. You're just bad at stuff. It's confirmed. Yep. So uh, Mike's vast lack of knowledge about all things Everything. aside, yeah. one more quick note on this story. Mike is the head of Helping Hands Ministries, which has an active Amazon Smile account. Really? So. Really? Uh, if you're hearing this and you don't want that guy to get charity from Amazon purchases, maybe go on and let Amazon know that they shouldn't be giving this guy their money because, well, one, he's an asshole and he should have less money. But two, because when they do kick him off the program, he's going to have a meltdown and burn his Nikes or whatever it is he <laughs> bought from Amazon. <laughs> and we're all going to be here to watch it and make fun and, of oh, it. Yeah. Yeah. And with a quick reminder that his charity has less oversight than real ones, we're going to close out the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, we'll use the same old words in a brand new order. And fold and fold and there. Perfect. Dude, See? No, dude, that's not going to work. It is, too, going to work. Hey, guys. What are you up to? Oh, hey, Noah. E Eli's trying to make his own diapers out of toilet paper. Dude, you should not do that. Right. Oh, would that I could, Noah. Did you know that diapers cost an average of $900 a year? Jesus. What am I, made out of money? Well, I mean, okay, but Eli, you can't make your own diapers. Also, that's definitely not a diaper. Correct. Okay, now you sound like Anna. Well, what am I supposed to do? Oh, maybe just ask our listeners nicely to sign up to support the show at patreon.com slash scathing atheist. <laughs> Why would anyone sign up to support the show at patreon.com slash scathing atheist? Lots Noah? of reasons, Eli, lots of reasons that they would go to patreon.com slash scathing atheist and sign up. They'll be helping the podcast get made. Plus, they'll get a patron only RSS feed with an extended commercials at the end. So you can skip them version of our show. That they can play on any podcast player. And. If they chip in a couple bucks more, they get free copies of our ebooks, a signed hard copy of our latest book, or even swag packages and gifts. Not to mention access to our bonus content and AMAs. That's right. They do. Now, what's that website where they can help the show again? Yeah, no, we didn't say it enough. Patreon.com slash scathing atheist. Patreon.com slash scathing atheist. All right, guys, I'm in. Now, help me rewind this toilet paper. Just like, but honestly, though, what shape do you think the baby will be? Like, tube? Okay, well, yours. Yeah. <laughs> Have all the acronyms in your life made too much sense recently? Have all the words meant the same boring thing it says they mean in the dictionary? Has A been unable to be both equal to and not equal to B? Well, why not take a break from all that hassle and dive into yet another chapter of Mama Bear Apologetics on this week's installment of God Awful Books. All right. So quick reminder, we are now in the second part of Mama Bear Apologetics. Lies you've heard, but didn't know what they were called. <laughs> and we've the been name of the sex. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Not the lies you haven't never <laughs> heard. <laughs> acronym this. Urine. No. Okay. Just yeah. I'm not doing an acronym this time. No, heard never called. 
That's the title. Yeah. So we've been mutilating anagrams in the name of defeating all the isms Hillary Morgan Ferrer doesn't like. So far, we've done self-helpism, which we learned was the belief that anyone but God can fix you. Mm -hmm. Naturalism, the belief in stuff, reality, nature. And today, <laughs> nature. Yeah. yep. Mm -hmm. And today we'll be tackling chapter seven. I'd believe in God if there were any shred of evidence. Skepticism. Wonderful. Hillary Morgan Ferrer is doubtful about doubting stuff. <laughs> Great. <laughs> She's going to have even more trouble than normal making sentences happen this time. And oh, I'm pretty yeah. excited about yes, it. Oh, yeah. She is. All right. So we're going to start this chapter with a time in 2012 that Bart Ehrman kicked the shit out of Daniel Wallace in a debate, which if listeners would like, they can watch on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel. But Hillary's pretty sure he lost. No. Um, and actually, Hillary doesn't want to talk about the debate. She wants to talk about one of the deleted scenes, the one Bart Ehrman is afraid to show you, namely <laughs> when... <laughs> Someone during the Q&A asked Ehrman what it would take for him to be convinced that the wording of Mark's gospel was certain, to which Ehrman responded, 10 manuscripts all copied from the original of Mark's gospel within one week of its completion, end quote. And look, Weird. that's a stupid standard, and Hillary admits that. And Ehrman later said, yeah, that was a stupid answer to a stupid question. But to Hillary, that's the problem with skepticism. That, that it demands too much evidence. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet she, it is. Yeah. <laughs> she says, quote, Ehrman demanded evidence that doesn't exist for any ancient literary work. Footnote. Um, we do have original documents like shipping logs and receipts, but no original documents of literature that would have been copied and circulated. Well, but End footnote. Literature <laughs> means not true, though. <laughs> Also, the topic of that debate was, is the original New Testament lost? There's not a number of signed first editions of Mark's gospel at which I abandon the scientific method. This yeah. debate has nothing to do with that. Well, scientific right. method and, question. But like, funny that she missed the fact that we also don't take any of these other ancient literary works as things that really happened and were definitely said by their authors. <laughs> mm -hmm. We also... We get to revisit one of Heath's favorite parts of the case for Christ here when she says, quote, <sighs> historians determine authenticity by comparing two things, the number <laughs> of manuscripts recovered and the time gap between the original autographs and the copies. What about if you, height? <laughs> if you were to stack the ancient <laughs> documents that have survived to this day for an average classical writer, it would stand about four feet high. <laughs> if you were to stack the recovered manuscripts of the New Testament, it would stand about 5,280 feet high. True. Quite a difference, end quote. <laughs> what, from okay. up till when? Yesterday? <laughs> First of all, there's no way it's exactly a mile. Right. <laughs> there's yeah. no way. Or even about exactly a mile. They also, stopped when they got to a mile. They're like, yeah, oh, that's plenty. That's all we really need. That's a, an impactful number there. But <laughs> why, not, why wouldn't she just say a mile there? Right. It's 5,280 feet. But more importantly, I'd need to see at least 10 miles of truth height before skepticism <laughs> is canceled. Yeah, for sure. I need to see the truth height cop immediate copies of truth, t yeah. 10 of them 100%. in miles. Yeah. So what is Hillary's point, you ask? Well, you know, despite admitting in the footnote that she's full of shit, her point is that if you're going to apply those standards, then no ancient history is true. Except for, you know, history based on receipts or shipping manifest <laughs> <laughs> but as she puts it quote when it comes to radical skepticism evidence <laughs> isn't the real issue and radical quote. skepticism yep the like the extra medium stake of epistemology the <laughs> radical, <laughs> radically skeptic but why would the you know why would any of this truth height shit matter unless we were skeptical of the bible's age <laughs> Right? Like, I mean, do they feel like there's a certain point at which, like, lies just mature into truth or something? <laughs> Maybe. That's possible. <laughs> gotta leave that open. You gotta oak it. You gotta get them oakier. <laughs> yeah. So now it's time for 
implications for skepticism. Right, yeah, realizing malaria is caused by mosquitoes and not the sinfulness of Caribbean people. I'm not sure what she's going to use. Like, she's going to have her own. I just want to make sure <laughs> that one gets listed right up front. Yeah, no, she doesn't <laughs> use that one. Uh, HMO no, interesting. is going to start off this section by letting us know she is not against regular skepticism. She loves skepticism when it means you can still be Christian. What she doesn't like is the mean, stupid skepticism of Bart Ehrman. Radical or, skepticism. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or as she puts it, quote, you can always put another question between yourself and God. This is why it's so important to ask, why am I asking this question? Sometimes doubting your doubts is the most rational thing you can do. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> and this is definitely where her editor had to cut a nearly infinite section about doubt, doubt, doubting, and doubt, 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 <laughs> doubting. <laughs> Quick summary. Even numbers of doubting is the right way to You're go. Right. So yeah, just exactly. stick with two to make yeah. it simple. So she, then she's going to do our job for us a little bit more. She writes, quote, how much of the Bible includes things that cannot be measured, counted, or physically experimented on? Probably a lot of it, if not all of it. All of it. How yeah. do we respond? Do we say, Oh, no, the Bible isn't true because I can't test it in a chemistry lab. <laughs> and then she literally got confused by her own rhetorical question. Her very next sentence is, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That is real. She continues exact quote. Wait, huh? That's not how we <laughs> test historical documents. No, nope. there is no historical document that can be proven in the same way we treat things that are proven in physics or chemistry. End quote. Well, not the ones that are wrong. Those get disproven. <laughs> but not proven. We can prove heliocentric historical documents with science. They. Maybe, maybe just admit God is more of a humanities kid. That would yeah, be the, you know, get, get you out of so many arguments. Yeah, right. Okay, so to be clear, the argument we're getting right now is that there are things that are absolutely demonstrably true and then everything else is tied, right? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly, <laughs> because she concludes, quote, why do some people treat the Bible like it's the one historical document that has to bear this level of proof, end quote? Yeah, but those... Quran-based astronomy classes are mostly just for anti-Christian spite. <laughs> we, don't, we don't really believe that stuff. <laughs> but I get well, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, no, set aside her. all the religious texts. It's because those are the only ones people are saying are fucking true. Right? <laughs> right? Like if people started saying the Iliad was a goddamn historical account, we'd have to also tell them how stupid they were, too. It's not that academia not is being unusually hard on your real? theory. It's that your theory is unusually stupid. Yeah. If you walked into the White House and you were like, gays can't get married because Circe turned everyone into pigs, we'd have to be like, no, <laughs> Circe didn't turn everyone into pigs. All right. So then... She's going to explain to us the problem with demanding proof of things <laughs> is that it does away with miracles. Yep. Which, to be fair oh, to Hillary, is true. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And she puts it. Do that. Here's how she puts it. Quote, once miracles are dismissed, you've done away with Christ's resurrection, the miracle on which the entire gospel hangs. Sorry, folks. You can't have Christianity without the resurrection of Jesus. End quote. The end. Like, yeah, you're right. You can't have both Christianity and things that happen in the universe. Why are you telling us this, though? <laughs> That's amazing. That's like the whole First Corinthians. That's just like yeah. a big letter being like, listen, if you get rid of the resurrection, then we all look like idiots. So the resurrection must be real, assholes. End of letter. <laughs> but it's time to get serious because, as Hillary says, quote, the new atheists are nothing to laugh at. While we can poke fun at their ideas and methods. Uh, well, actually, that's like the only thing y you can't poke fun at. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the part we definitely got right. Yeah. So while she thinks she can poke fun at their ideas and methods, real quote, their influence cannot be underestimated in contemporary online culture. End huh. quote. Huh. You hear that, boys? We're important on the internet. What's Woo! worse, that we cannot be underestimated. I feel like I can be underestimated. I am definitely <laughs> under... I, every time I tell someone podcaster, I am underestimated. <laughs> so now it's time for a section titled, How Not to Debate an Atheist. All right, well, if her answer is 
send a 45 page email to the contact page without ever listening to the goddamn podcast I'm on board. That would be a good <laughs> yeah, one. Maybe. It sadly is not. No. <laughs> Her answer is that we new atheists, you see, we are sneaky. We are. See, she explains to us that each debate has two sides. And with old atheism, the argument was there is no God versus there is a God. But the new atheists have, quote, redefined atheism as a lack of belief, end quote. God, she's painting clarification as a dirty trick we use. <laughs> right. L- literally, because as H. Mo puts it, quote, the new atheists are essentially saying the soles of my shoes are base. Thus, anywhere they stand, they are safe. The other person has the burden of proof, end yeah, quote. Right, yeah. like no matter which argument I use, I keep being wrong. They must be <laughs> cheating. <laughs> Fuck you, you idiot. <laughs> So now it's time to roar like a monkey. Oh, finally. All right. Mangle this anagram again. <laughs> so first up, we're going to recognize the message. R. Yep. And the message of skepticism is atheism, which to be fair, it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of infinity different messages but yeah, yeah, yeah okay. on this subject yeah mm-hmm. yeah and and she lets us know at the outset that she's going to use atheists own quotes against us here so point number one of atheism's message if you can't know everything for sure you can't know anything for sure or as hitchens um, said quote of a quote we can't say ellipses there is no god and there is no afterlife we can say there is no persuasive evidence for it, end quote of a quote. <laughs> at which point Hilldog was like, fuck, okay. Hitchens' quote is pointing at me, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And scene, moving on. Yeah. <laughs> she just goes straight to the next thing here. Hey, Hill, it, it's only using our words against us if if we don't still win the argument. You Just, you just yeah. using our words doesn't mean it's against <laughs> us. Just... <laughs> I throw your book at you. Okay, point two of our message <laughs> came back and hit me in the head. That was impressive, actually. How did you guys do that? <laughs> yeah. It boomeranged. So point two of the atheism message, religion is child abuse. So, um, yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. I'm the guy on the couch with popcorn meme. Let's hear it. I want to <laughs> hear what she thinks about religion is child abuse and how that's uh, uh, her side of the point. That's uh, that's our, our side, message, but it's yeah. not true. We're recognizing yeah, it's oh, it's not. No, it's not true. Can let's, here's oh, how she yeah. let's explain that away. It's not. Let, let me tell you why. Here's how she ends that section. Quote: If hell is a real place, as the Bible says it is, then it's definitely not child abuse to make your kids aware of it. That is correct. Just to be, <laughs> just to be just, yes, it, with with that stipulation, you're right. Just go ahead. <laughs> you don't have to describe past what scripture does, essentially trying to scare them towards salvation, but they should definitely know how miserable an eternity without God will be, end quote, about how it's not child abuse. Hey, uh, no, Hillary Morgan Fair, a quick question about the cemetery fund. I just Next get up. Into- oh, all right. <laughs> Message Never number mind. three. Oh, we're not going to cool. talk about conversion therapy or not teaching them about no. evolution. or uh-uh. Okay, all right. Sorry. Message number three. Let's move on. Okay. Yeah. Message number three of atheism. Man is not equal to God. He's better. And she doesn't have any quotes from atheists in this section. She's just like, you all think you're so smart. I bet you think you exist, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, no, no, look, I'll concede this one. If there is one thing that this book proves, it's that existing isn't necessarily better than not existing. There are plenty of atheists that would be better yep. if they were more like God. Yep. <laughs> Message number four. Belief in God is some sort of wish fulfillment akin to believing in Santa Claus, to which she literally responds, quote, Ask those who have lost a child if they believe in Christ simply because it's easy, end quote. It's not easy to believe in a God who created dead children. And I'm pointing my argument at myself again. Fuck. Well, I, I, <laughs> Fuck. Wait, but, but OK, look, look, unless her assumption is that people with dead kids are taking comfort in the fact that at least they won't have to see that little asshole in the afterlife. I have no idea what point she's even trying to make there. <laughs> yes, of course, that's why the uh, specifically that group of people. That, speci- that for them, for sure. <laughs> them. 
All the books in the room are hitting her in the face right now, wherever <laughs> she is. And finally, the last message of skepticism, religion keeps us from asking questions, which Hillary wants us to know is totally untrue in her chapter about why skepticism is bad. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, it's not that it keeps you guys from asking questions. It keeps you from listening to the goddamn answers, <laughs> right? Like, it's the perpetual question. That is our issue. Yeah. Well, it's actually weirder than that because she basically spends this section agreeing with us. She says, quote, Christians should have evidence for what they believe, end quote. But again, her definition of evidence is the relative height of ancient text. <laughs> so, yeah. What about width? She never talks about width. So, all right, yeah. we're roaring. What about time of ancient text? Oh, right, there yeah, you go. no shit. Space and time are the same thing. Yeah. All right, so we're roaring, so now it's time to, oh, offer discernment. <laughs> and man, she is really going to give away the game in this section when she says, quote, I can't say enough good things about healthy skepticism. Uh, no, she can't. That is true. That <laughs> is true. What isn't healthy is a demand to know everything. Hey, quote. Say what you will, but at least she's genuine. She puts her brain where her mouth is. <laughs> That's right. She continues, quote, this is especially true when it comes to the problem of evil. We are not omniscient. We will never fully know the mind of God and why he allows certain things to happen. Sometimes he may withhold clarity from us until we learn a specific lesson first, end quote. Okay, I painted the fence and sanded the floor. Now, can you tell me why you gave my child a face cancer, please, God? Still, still no? Okay, no, yeah, sorry. My skepticism, it's getting out of hand. Sorry, yeah, right. sorry. Like, no, you're right. <laughs> I should have doubted right. that. You're awesome. I'm going to keep worshiping you. Yep. So uh, so God is firmly ensconced as a, a Batman villain at best, according to <laughs> Hillary. Uh, but it's we're going to A, argue for a healthier approach. And again, HMO is going to hit us with that idea that Christianity loves skepticism. Unlike other religions, quote, Christianity is the only one that has testable claims and invites rational inquiry. End quote. Oh, what? cool, cool. Like which testable claims? Uh, uh, mm, no. Yep. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Seriously. That's it. She doesn't tell us what those claims are. She just assures us that Christianity has them. How many miles them. of truth does your book have? <laughs> yeah. And it's worth pointing out that in the last section, her answer to the problem of evil was, Maybe God was teaching you a lesson with baby face cancer. <laughs> so, well, I mean, to be fair, I can think of all kinds of testable claims Christianity makes, right? It's, it's like when they say that products are clinically tested. Yes, they yeah, are. Exactly. <laughs> right. And Mama Bear approved. <laughs> so now it's time to R, reinforce through discussion, discipleship, and prayer. Really good section coming up now. <laughs> Rare. Nailing it. I mean it. So she's got two things to do here. The first is let your kids ask questions and let them know when you don't have answers to those questions, which is great, except we know that she doesn't believe in any of the true answers to those questions. Right. So exactly. it comes across less as good advice and more like a Spanish inquisitor explaining that he's just curious. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, how did the Spanish Inquisition work? No, it's good skepticism, uh, child. Um, end of parenting. <laughs> what was it? Was it like ice? Actually, yeah. Sorry, I said end of parenting. Don't <laughs> don't do that. And uh, now it's time for discussion questions. Are you guys ready? Sure, why not? Mm. All right, icebreaker. If you were to ask God one question, what would it be? And why? <laughs> uh, hey, God. Yeah, have a seat. Um, What would you say <laughs> you do here? <laughs> I think mine might be, when did you stop beating your chosen ones? Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Two, main theme. There is healthy skepticism and there's unhealthy skepticism. Describe the differences between healthy and unhealthy skepticism. Why should we encourage our kids to have healthy skepticism? How can we tell when skepticism has turned unhealthy? Okay, wait. Answer that she's actually looking for here. 
skepticism is healthy when kids apply it to things that we don't bother to lie to them about anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Number three, self-evaluation. People often fall into the trap of either answering every question with only God knows, just have faith or by responding to every answer with. But what about blank? In other words, some people don't seek answers to any of the tough questions and others are never satisfied, no matter how good the answers draw a horizontal line on a piece of paper <laughs> with blind faith. <laughs> two chapters in a row. We have had to draw yep. a paper <laughs> with blind faith. Betty on one end oh, and never satisfied Nancy on the other. Where do you think you fall on the spectrum and why? Ah, <laughs> oh, fuck. No, I drew the line vertically. I'm going to have to pass on this one. <laughs> I ruined the whole piece <laughs> of paper now. Wrong. <laughs> Wait a minute. So hold on a second. Did fucking doubting Donna pull out on him at the last minute? Right? <laughs> with, with, with never satisfied Nancy doing here. When the fuck did the opposite of blind faith become live in perpetual dissatisfaction? <laughs> she's just, she can't even be honest about her scale from one to ten without her whole argument coming apart. <laughs> fuck <amazing>. you. <laughs> ten is really not on our side with this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's work with never satisfied Nancy. All right. Brainstorm. Compile a list of questions your kids have asked you that you didn't know how to answer. I bet if it's a big fucking list. <laughs> a I bet that's button. a really big list. <laughs> oh, I want to see well the list. Her. If you're part of a group, create this list together. Keep this list somewhere that allows you to easily access to it and then add to it, like on your phone or in your purse. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love that a whole bunch of Hillary Morgan Farrah fans definitely now have a piece of paper in their purse that says like why would the Holocaust happen? Like, on the paper that they have. I really wish I could watch them explain that when it falls out. That's got to happen once in a while. <laughs> yep. Hey, uh, Karen, why, why do you have a piece of paper that says, why would the Holocaust happen on it? <laughs> Nothing. It's my, my fucking kid. He's a hyper skeptic. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Finally, release the bear. Ask your kids what questions they have for God. If they can't think of any, pick one that your group put on the master list. Have a family night to research the answer. Obviously, don't pick questions you can't answer, like, did Jesus ever have head lice? An actual question <laughs> asked by one of our mama bear kids recently. <laughs> she says, okay, all right. So if your friends honestly believe that there is an all-knowing being in the universe and yet cannot think of a single question to ask him. Your friends are goddamn pre-mulch, lady. Get better. For, just set yourself on fire in the hopes that some of them will burn with you. And while she takes care of that, we're going to close things off for the night. Eli, I appreciate all the suffering that you've endured to get us this far through the book, uh, but not enough to let you off the hook. So we're going to be back soon with even more God Awful Books. Before we gently close our pedals until next month, I want to tell everybody that Tim Robertson is fucking awesome. I mentioned him at the end of the show, you know, that he handles our social media, but he does all kind of odd jobs and shit for us. And he has become as integral a part of our team as anybody whose voice you hear on the show. So, Tim, thank you for all the work you do. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our half-sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, this show would wither on the vine if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for all the things he does. I need to thank Eli Bosnick for all the things he eventually agrees not to do. I need to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Lusions for Get This Shit, 23 years of happy marriage as of the day after this episode airs. Also want to thank Eli's Australian accent coach for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. Incidentally, he said in this email he had nothing to plug except his landscape photography page, which I put in the show notes because fuck yeah, we like landscape photography. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most marvelous mammals, Matthew D. T. Fausto, Trev Black, motherfucking Summer Blaze, Totes Not a Ninja, and Andreas. Matthew D. T. and Fausto, whose intellects are so vast Trump wants to open them up for drilling, Trev Black and motherfucking Summer Blaze, who might actually be getting any younger, and Totes Not a Ninja and Andreas, whose martial arts skills are just normal levels wink. Together, these seven people, enthusiastically sunny moments and withdrawal symptoms help make my bullshit job remain a job this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the 
ease of complementability that it takes to give us money. But if you think you're up to the challenge, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash scathing atheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad free version of every episode. Or you can make a one time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but money's too expensive, you can also help a ton by leaving us a five star review, telling a friend about the show, and following at PIAT pod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media. Our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com. Roger Stone's prosecutor. Shit. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.